We're now ready to talk about our ideal integral compensation, or our PI controller. And so what we're going to be doing, of course, is improving our steady state error. But while we're doing this, we wanna keep in mind that we wanna have a minimal effect on the transient response. So we're gonna come back to this idea later of sort of adjusting both our steady state error and the transient response. But right now we just wanna be adjusting the steady state error. So from our steady state error unit, which is chapter seven in the textbook, we know that if we add a pole at the origin, that's going to increase our system type. So adding pole at the origin, which we had also referred to as a pure integration, so pure integration, and so this was one over S in our block diagram in our, in our algebra. And again, what we're saying that does is this is increasing our system type. And so what that does ultimately is reduce the steady state error for a given input. So it reduces our steady state error for a given input. So just as a quick example or a quick refresher, if we started with a type zero system and we add one pure integration, then that's going to become a type one system. So if we now have a type one system, that's going to eliminate any, state, any steady state error that we would have had for step inputs. So eliminates steady state error for our step input. So if we had a step input initially into our type zero system, it would have had some finite steady state error. But if we put that same step input into our adjusted type one system, it's no longer going to have any steady state error. So it'll be zero. However, if we just come in here and we add some pole at the origin, ultimately that's going to change the root locus. So this will change our root locus. And so ultimately we don't want to do that because remember we're trying to have a minimal effect on our transient response. So we don't wanna be adjusting our root locus. So let's sort of go back to our basic definition of when points are on the root locus. So we're gonna to have to consider our angles and our magnitudes for our various poles and zeros. So first let's talk about our angle. So we can say in general, the angle of our K, G of S, H of S at any point on the root locus is given by, so we have angle of K, G of S, H of S is equal to the sum of our zero angles minus the sum of our pole angles. And so what we can see from that is if we're adding some pole angle, we're changing this summation here. So if we want to sort of have no net effect, then we also need to add some zero, which has a similar angle, such that the contributions from the two are canceling out. So let's say we're going to also add a zero with a similar angle to our pole such that angular contributions will cancel out. So angular contributions will cancel. And so we're gonna look at this graphically in the next video, but here let's just start by, by talking about this mathematically. And of course, ultimately, if a point is going to be on the root locus, then this summation here needs to be some odd multiple of 180 degrees. And so again, we're gonna come back at and look at this graphically, and I think hopefully that will sort of solidify this, this in, your, in your head and make it a little more clear. Okay, so the next thing we wanna talk about is our game. So if our, our pole and zero are close to one another, then we're gonna see ultimately our root locus shape and position is going to be roughly the same because we're gonna need the same gain values K in order to essentially for our closed loop poles to be at that position. So if our pole 
and zero are close to one another, then our gain k at points of interest should be relatively unchanged. So it's not going to be completely unchanged, but the closer we can get the pole and the zero to one another, the, the truer this is going to be. So, and remember, ultimately, we don't want to be changing this, so we want those to be relatively close. And that's because our gain at any point, so our gain at any point is going to be given by k is equal to one over the magnitude of g of s times h of s. And so this is all just coming from our previous analysis of root locus in, in the previous unit. Um, but we know that this is going to be equal to the product, so pi, capital pi, of our pole links divided by the product of our zero links. And so again, what we can see is if we're adding some pole that is going to be sort of increasing the factor of this numerator, we wanna add some zero in the denominator that's also going to be increasing that denominator by approximately the same amount, such that that gain value, k, can stay the same at any given point. So then, sort of in summary from this initial discussion, we can say an ideal integral compensator is going to have a pole at the origin and a zero very close to that pole. So an ideal integral compensator has a pole at the origin. And so remember that pole at the origin is to reduce our steady state error for a given input type. But in order to keep our root locus unchanged, we also have to have this zero, which is going to be very close to the pole, or in other words, very close to the origin. So we're adding this pole at the origin, but we also have to have the zero, which is close to the pole. So this is sort of our key idea, again, for this ideal integral compensator. And so in the next video, we're gonna come back and look at this graphically, and then we're gonna talk about how we actually implement that in our block diagram.